The next speaker is uh, John Marini, also well known, I'm sure, to this audience. Uh, John is going to talk to us today about the microvasculature in ventilator-induced lung injury, target or cause. John. Thank you, Art. Uh, and I'd certainly like to begin by thanking my, my hosts. Um, McKay has been very generous to all of us in bringing us here to join you. Uh, I'd like to pay special uh, thanks and tribute to Krister Strom, who has uh, behind the scenes been organizing much of this uh, organiz uh, organization. This morning, I think you've heard from Arthur the uh, importance of the ventilation side of the equation of mechanical ventilation in causing injury to the ventilated patient with ARDS. And from Shelley Magder, you heard more about the cardiac side, and from Antonio Pizzenti, also an emphasis on the vasculature in ARDS. Most of our guidelines in the clinical setting have focused on the tidal cycle. Which tidal pressure do we use? Which PEEP do we use? And certain things have gone completely unaddressed, such as frequency, minute ventilation, vascular pressure. Do these influence the outcome of our patients? And that's what I'd like to address this morning, not with clinical data, but with experimental data that to us at least has been quite convincing. So I'm asking the question, if we concentrate on the vasculature, is it the target of ventilator-induced lung injury or are manipulatable factors related to the microvasculature what we can use to eliminate ventilator-induced lung injury, or at least reduce its severity? I think we agree that the key principles for lung prote protection is that the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury is proportional to the transalveolar pressure. Arthur talked about transpulmonary pressure. I think what he really meant to imply, using that traditional term, is the transalveolar pressure that we're applying to the lung. Lung recruitment is essential to avoid ventilator-induced lung injury when, and possibly only when, high inflation pressures are being used. Those two things I'm quite certain of. Modifiable cofactors may be important in ventilator-induced lung injury and are relatively unexplored. I call upon position, total minute ventilation requirement, temperature of the patient, and vascular pressure. I have data on all of those, but I'd like to focus on vascular pressure. One of the principles that many of us working in this area hold closest is that interdependence among elements of a heterogeneous lung causes intensified strain on the collapsed portions that are close to those areas that are re-expanding. Many years ago, Jerry Mead suggested that from a simple geometrical analysis, you could amplify the stresses experienced by an open lung by a factor of three or four or five, depending on how high the open lung pressures rose. So it's the collapsing lung units that seem to be most at risk for being shredded or signaled into inflammation. If we have a lung with ARDS, as Arthur showed you, you have expandable areas, open areas, and in some regions you have either unyielding tissue that won't open or tissue that will open but only under high pressure. So you can have stretch of the open lung. Some people think this is the most important factor. 
you can have airway trauma occurring in the very small junctions of the terminal airways that are unsupported by cartilage, and you can have forces which are tangential, called shearing forces. And again, we are concentrating now on the alveolus. We're talking about the air spaces. But remember, there are blood vessels embedded in all of this tissue. The lung is an interface between gas and blood. CT scanning shows us that mechanically, the lung is different depending on where we look. In the dependent area, you may have consolidated areas that are never exposed to airway pressure. Don't worry too much about those. They're protected from airway pressure. The zone at risk is that at the junction of closed and, alveolar t uh, closed and open alveolar lung units. Now, in this example, it looks like it's in one geographical plane, but of course it can be wherever there are closed and open lung units. Under the influence of gravity, they tend to predominate along this margin. If we look at the end of expiration, in you have open and closed lung units, and you apply a tidal force, if the force is moderate, then it's likely that you will make that lung susceptible to inflammatory mediation when a second hit occurs to make the lung tissue vulnerable. I don't have time to go into that mechanism, but under moderate stress and strain and the right precondition, you may damage the lung. This is a very intense area of investigation, and it can lead to cellular inflammation and infiltration through an initiated cas inflammatory cascade. But some of us believe that at pressures we tr traditionally use in the clinical setting, actually what happens first is a rupture at the junction of closed and open lung tissue, leading directly to cellular infiltration and inflammation as a secondary event. So first is the, sh is the rip, the tear, the cut, the wound, and then inflammation under extreme conditions. This is a large animal, healthy to begin with, where a transpulmonary force of 35 centimeters of water per tidal cycle was applied for, I'm forgetting, I think three or four hours with low levels of PEEP. And what do you notice? You notice that in the supine animal, and here is the heart and the ventral areas and the dorsal areas, it looks as if this area is much more damaged than this area. If you're the investigator, as we were, this tells us immediately that the overstretched areas are not the ones the most at risk. In fact, what we think happened was a progression of the interface between closed and open lung units further and further toward the ventral surface. If you look closely at this tissue, it is hemorrhagic. And that hemorrhage occurred very early and very geographically defined, as if the cutting surface was shifted further and further upward. Could mediator release alone do this in a healthy lung? I don't think so. I think the mechanical forces are those that are tearing forces. We're not the only ones to uh, take interest in this bleeding phenomenon. This is from the University of Michigan, uh, Rich in the Journal of Trauma 2008. 
uh, in the year 2000 and uh, later uh, Kestaburi in 2002, showed that some features of the ventilation cycle can influence the degree of hemorrhage and inflammation that you see. Under low airway pressure controlled conditions, the lung tissue looks normal. When high inflation pressures are used at normal ventilation rates, you have tremendous bleeding and infiltration occurring. And for the sake of time, I'll not go through these others, but notice that there are differences depending on the ventilatory pattern characteristics that they were using. What I want you to notice is that bleeding was a big part. Tissue hemorrhage was a big part of the inflammation that they saw. What is the mechanism for that hemorrhagic edema? It could be signaling and mediator release, leading to tissue inflammation and disruption, or it could be disruption and then inflammation and mediator release. And the answer to that question is a very important one. Back to original physiology. Low lung volumes, high lung volumes. You've got emb wall embedded capillaries, you've got corner vessels and interstitial vessels, microvessels that are very fragile. The lung goes to high lung volume. What happens? These wall embedded capillaries are compressed, not stretched, compressed, protected evacuated sometimes of all blood. These microvessels are at great risk, however, because they stretch as the lung expands, whether you do it by negative pressure or a ventilator does that for you. So there's a big discrepancy in these very fragile vessels between those in an open lung and those in the interstitium. Those forces in the interstitium can actually get quite negative. This is from uh, a paper that uh, Marcelo Amato and I wrote together. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a chapter. Uh, interstitial pressure calculated here at a minus 56 centimeters of water. The alveolar pressure, 30 centimeters of water. What you measure as plateau pressure, 30 centimeters of water. Interstitial pressure, minus 56. The transmural microvascular pressure is in the range of 86 centimeters of water. That's huge stretching force on very fragile vessels, and they may break, as I'll show you later. And depending where you look in the lung, even in a healthy lung, as this work by Bakhoven shows, there are capillaries that are very distended and capillaries that are relatively small and compressed. It's beginning to get interesting because this is a target for damage. Long time ago now, back in the early 90s and even before, John West and his colleagues showed using a static lung that if you increase all vascular pressures at some point, the capillaries undergo stress fracture. They break. And blood vessels leak out from the capillary into the alveolar space. The blood has to get into the lung somehow. It must do so through a very large rip. There is no better explanation, I think, that we can come up with. But these were static, unventilated lungs. The higher the lung volume, the more likely it is that ripping would occur. But the key thing was vascular pressure, which you raised throughout the vasculature on the venous side and on the arterial side. It was a static system. We did dynamic experiments where we took rabbit lungs we hung them from a balance so that we could look at the rate of edema formation. We ventilated them, but we also perfused them with flows that we could control, 
or pressures that we could control on the upstream side and the downstream side. This was a relatively blood-free perfusate. Only a very, very small amount of blood was added to act as a marker for damage. And I think you can see these lungs, although pale, have areas which look like there is punctate hemorrhage. More about that in a moment. We did a number of experiments, and for this I give credit to my colleagues John Hodgkiss and Alain Brocard, who did the, the, the bulk of this work. Here you're looking at hemorrhage score, and here ventilation frequency and vascular pressure. When we ventilate with normal frequency and normal vascular pressures, we find that even when the alveolar pressure is quite high, there's very little damage. When we ventilate at a normal frequency and high vascular pressure, there was a lot of ca capillary damage. And here, you're looking at a uh, upstream vascular pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury, a frequency of 20. Alveolar pressure was high, about 30 centimeters of water. End expiratory pressure was low, about 3 centimeters of water. Ventilation frequency and pattern was identical. The only thing changed was the upstream microvascular pressure. And one other thing, the frequency with which the lung was ventilated. So peak alveolar pressure is the same. Peak vascular pressure was different depending on category. And expiratory pressure was the same for all categories. Mean airway pressure, mean vascular pressure were all the same. The only thing in this particular experiment that changed was frequency and vascular pressure. And let me show you what happened. At a normal frequency and a normal upstream vascular pressure, there was a little bit of hemorrhage, but not very much. At a normal frequency and a high upstream vascular pressure, there was a great deal of hemorrhage. Now that may not be so surprising to you. But when we kept the pressure exactly the same in the vasculature and only reduced the frequency with which the lung was expanded, the number of cycles, and I'll come back to that in a moment, the hemorrhage score dropped very considerably. These were published data in critical care medicine a few years ago. So two things are important, the upstream vascular pressure and the frequency with which you apply that high stress cycle. Why is the lower frequency protective? Well, one possibility is hypercapnia could have attenuated the inflammation. But remember, this is a cell-free system except for very little bit of blood. Perhaps the lungs contained enough neutrophils to liberate enough inflammatory mediators to cause the hemorrhages, but that seems a little far-fetched to me. I don't think it had to do with the hypercapnia. Hypercapnia tends to attenuate uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. That was shown by Alain Brocard. It was also shown by uh, Mark Sinclair. Uh, and these are just illustrations from a eucapnic <coughs> ventilator-induced lung injury and hypercapnic ventilator-induced lung injury. Sinclair showed that the acute hypercapnia and acidosis has a suppressive effect on inflammation. So one possibility is that the lower ventilation frequency protected the lung because of hypercapnia. There's another possibility. Perhaps if the lung is capable of resealing itself, we simply were ventilating too quickly so that there was insufficient repair time 
between cycles. If we slow it down, the lung has a chance to reseal. That sounds like an extraordinary statement. But it was shown by uh, a number of individuals that, including D.D.A. Dreyfus a long time ago in 1992, that the lung can show less in the way of albumin leak minutes after it has been produced. Five minutes after clear damage was being shown here, there was basically a return to baseline levels. So if the damage isn't so bad, the lung can recover. And something similar has been shown uh, in the laboratory setting by Gadget and, and uh, Rolf Hubmeier and their colleagues. If you apply a label which enters the cell membrane when it's open, during the ventilation, you show that marker of injury is quite high. But if you apply the label after you've stopped the stretching, the overstretching, you've created the holes, but you've stopped overstretching, you don't see the marker interior. So maybe there's a repair uh, element here. I, I would like to believe that. However, the size of the holes that we, lay, we found, and I'll show you in just a moment, were so large that we believe that that is an unlikely explanation for why frequency reduction was important in our experiments. Another possibility is that the lung is eventually going to break, but we make cumulative damage over time as we keep generating cycle after cycle, 20,000 times a day, 30,000 times a day. If we could drop that way back, perhaps with extracorporeal CO2 removal, reduce the ventilation requirement, we might be able to avoid the cumulative damage that occurs over time and let the lung adapt to this kind of stress. Now, what do I mean by that? Do we have any data that's, that speaks to that? Here you're looking at weight gain in our experimental preparation. Here at a frequency of 5, here at a normal frequency of 20. Again, the conditions are all the same. The vascular pressures, the airway pressures, everything is the same. At the slow frequency, the inspiratory time fraction is prolonged. And by the way, others have shown that when you extend the inspiratory time, that's a damaging influence on the lung. So it does not explain what I'm about to show you. As we proceed for the first 10 minutes of the experiment, no trouble. Okay? But when we get to this point, we begin a tearaway exponential function as the lung floods. It's as if a dike has broken. A dam holding back suddenly breaks and releases. Another way of looking at that. Here is a paper clip. Here is the maximum point of stress. I'm moving it like this. First few cycles, nothing much. After a few more cycles, it breaks. Materials failure of the collagen that holds the lung together. Cumulative materials failure is a possibility. So is progressive overload of interdependent elements that are breaking one at a time. The weakest elements break and they throw the load on the other elements. For example, in the northeastern United States in the summer of 2003, the power grid was brought down in most of the northeast by one power plant that failed to make its contribution. And then progressively, 
the load was thrown on the others. So sequentially, bing, 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 all of them went down. Think of it this way, and Dr. Gattinoni has given me this slide. You have a strain, a stress of 12 pounds, you have six fibers, you take a count of what each of them has to bear up, two pounds per fiber. Six of them, 12 pounds, two pounds per fiber. Take half of them away, and now they have to suspend four pounds per fiber. And the weakest among them will then drop out and throw an additional load on. It's another hypothesis to explain what we found in response to frequency. It's like a frayed rope. Once you get to a certain point, it'll break, and then allow the flooding to occur, allow the red cells to enter the alveolar spaces. I've told you that the increasing the microvascular pressure on the upstream side makes a tremendous contribution to ventilator-induced lung injury for the same ventilation pattern, and also that the frequency was important. But would it surprise you to know that if you drop the downstream pressure, you also intensify ventilator-induced lung injury? Boy, that doesn't sound likely, does it? But it's true. In this experiment, uh, again, my colleague Ellen Brocard looked at alveolar pressures of 20, 25 centimeters, 30 centimeters of water on each tidal cycle, and he looked at indices of edema and permeability. And what he found was that when the downstream pressure was dropped, this is the high pressure for ventilation, but low downstream pressure, the edema went up and the permeability went up. Another vascular factor. What can you think of to explain this? Well, one of the things is Niagara Falls, like Shelley was talking about. The higher the waterfall, here the waterfall makes a difference. Here, the pressure across the lung is dissipating energy through the lung on delicate elements. The energy transferred to the lung is accentuated by a disparity between the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. Another possibility is vascular interdependence, which I don't want to mention, but endothelial, now, we're not talking about epithelial, we're talking about endothelial shear forces might be accentuated as you create episodic zone two conditions during the inflation cycle. Zone three conditions, the vessels are open throughout the ventilation cycle. Zone two conditions, they're closed or nearly closed through part of the ventilation cycle. Zone three conditions, capillaries open. Zone two conditions, capillaries narrowed. The same blood flow is coursing through the lung. Velocity accentuated. Energy dissipation up. Endothelial shear inflammation. Possibility, un unproven. So the microvascular events do impact ventilator-induced lung injury. Vascular dynamics have the potential to modulate ventilator-induced lung injury, raising the precapillary pressure, reducing postcapillary pressure may increase ventilator-induced lung injury. And when mechanical stresses are sufficiently high, increasing the respiratory frequency and or minute ventilation may worsen ventilator-induced lung injury. Now that happens to be something that I think we can, uh, we can uh, agree has clinical interest. Energy dissipation, vascular independence, endothelial shear are influenced by cardiac output and minute ventilation. So that reducing oxygen demand and ventilation targets may lower the risk for ventilator-induced lung injury. And again, extracorporeal CO2 removal might be just the thing, to rest the lung in many ways, 
The ventilation requirement is influenced by your oxygen demand. Not oxygen delivery, that's good. Oxygen demand is not so good. The ventilation requirement goes up. This increases the ventilation pressures and cycling frequency. The cardiac output goes up. That increases the pulmonary blood flow, the gradient across the lung, and that could cause trouble. Just a few images to, f to, f to finish. This is in our laboratory, perfusion fixed rabbit lung normally. Looks pretty normal. Doesn't have any breaks. This is perivascular hemorrhage. This should not be there. This is what we see in our ventilator-induced lung injury uh, rabbit uh, isolated, ventilated, perfused models. You see the red blood cells. This is a small blood vessel. This is alveolar space. This is perivascular hemorrhage, where the microvessels have rip ruptured. Here is an unnatural hole in the lung and other rips and tears. Up close, this picture shows very graphically the same kind of thing that West showed in a static lung raising vascular pressure. This was done only with ventilation. Now, and you can see exposed collagen. You can ask if small animals are like humans. The answer is no, they're not in many important ways. Humans have more collagen. They have stronger lungs than, than smaller animals. And so this has to be looked at carefully. But when we look at a human lung and look at a patient who has died having received high inflation pressures, this is a patient from, unfortunately, our hospital and published in the literature in critical care medicine. You see the same kind of tears that you see in the experimental setting. These are not fixation artifacts. These are actual uh, uh, rips and tears. And those rips and tears are large enough to tr allow transfer of gas and bacteria into the bloodstream and protein fragments, not just mediators, actual debris of inflammation. We have shown, as others have, that bacteria can disseminate from the lung under high inflation pressure, low PEEP conditions, and that PEEP is protective. Again, for the interest of time, I don't have to go into the, inf uh, the information except to say that it is a striking and very early phenomenon that the same amount of bacteria with the wrong ventilation pattern can probably open up communications that allow transfer of bacteria into the bloodstream. These are positive blood cultures occurring. With the same inflation pressure and high enough PEEP, none of the animals, or virtually none of the animals, uh, experience the bacteremia. And of course, gas can also enter the, the bloodstream. Different phases of the respira respiratory cycle. Last slide. The role of the vasculature, what's the potential clinical implications? We use inotropes, pulmonary vaso uh, vasoactive drugs, all the time. Some of you may ascribe to the wet versus dry approach to fluid management, and I think the ARDSnet will have something to say about that when they release their trial results. We can control metabolic rate and ventilation targets, and those things influence those th the, 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 the vasculature as well as the lung stress. We can modify our breathing patterns and change the vascular stresses. And use of too much PEEP may redirect blood flow in a disadvantageous way. And recruitment can improve uh, the situation by reducing the number of high stress interfaces. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, John, for a very clear presentation. We do have time for a couple of questions before lunch. Uh, please put up your hand if you would like to ask a question. Maybe I'll start. John? I had a couple questions. Um, your slide that showed increased lung weight with a number of cycles, it seems to me 
the, the hypothesis was that the number of stress cycles might be important. The way to address that quite simply would be to go four times as long because the respiratory rate is four times shorter. Have you done that to see in fact whether you do get the same increase? Um, wouldn't definitively prove it, but if it didn't go up, it would seem that that is not the explanation. No, I think you're right, Art, Art and that's an experiment that uh, actually needs to be done. Of course, as you know, as you take uh, a lung and take it out of the body and have no lymphatic drainage and you have a, a deteriorating preparation, uh, extending you know, the, the, the time period ex extensively could induce necrosis and, and other factors. But of course, if it didn't show, exactly. then I, I think it would, it would answer the question as to whether it's the number of cycles or the intensity of exposure that's important. It may be the intensity of exposure that's very important. And one just small comment. If I tell you that high inflation pressures are bad, then all of you should be damaging your lungs all the time. Because I saw some people in the audience when I was talking go, oh, take a, take a big stretching breath like that. When you do that, you are putting high tension on the lung, but it's easily repaired. Or it hasn't generated any signal. It may be a certain key frequency of doing this that's high, is important. You have to have a high enough stress for a long enough time and repeat it for a number of cycles for the body to get the message. And John, let me just ask a second question if there are no... Oh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I ask you one basic question. Um, would you mind telling me what the difference between um, strain and stress? Stress? Stre stre strain stretch. and the stress. Strain stress and strain. And strain. Uh, yeah. OK. To uh, uh, a simplified way of thinking about it is stress is the uh, tension that's, that's developed. Strain is the lengthening of the element, lengthening of the element above baseline length. So this, the stress is the amount of force applied per unit area, if you want to think of it in those terms. Strain is what results from, from, the, from the, uh, the overpressure. Is that right, Antonio? No. <laughs> that's right, OK. John, can I ask you maybe a final question, unless there are any more questions? Thank you very much, John. Uh, just to put together your two talks, uh, Professor Slutsky told us this morning that we can have some uh, systemic inflammation coming from the lung injury. And the more we distend the lung, the better or the higher will be the inflammatory response in the bloodstream. And you show that this is a fracture of the barrier, which may play a major role for the systemic inflammation. So could you make a comment on that? Is it uh, because the barrier is altered by the ventilation that we have a systemic inflammation, or it's related to the tissue inflammation in the lung, which has created a release in the bloodstream? Do you want me to address it first, John, and then you can comment? Go ahead. So did, uh, did I would suggest that I think John's right. If you have extreme stresses, you can have actual rupture in the lung. But I think you can also have translocation of mediators if you just have increased alveolar capillary permeability without necessarily having big holes. And I think the key there is that you have to have increased alveolar capillary permeability. You, and that can be caused by either the underlying disease process or it can be caused by the, the mechanical ventilation. Leading to, leading to alveolar capillary permeability. There's a very nice study by Tudor using an ex vivo lung model in which they put uh, TNF actually into the lung. I think it was TNF into the lung. And they had a perfused system. They didn't measure any TNF coming out of the lung. When they use naphthothiurea aphthal, to increase alveolar capillary permeability, then they got the increase in, in cytokines out. And I don't think that caused big holes in the lung. On the other hand, you, if you have the big holes in the lung, of course, it's an easy 
egress site for, for many things and much bigger things than proteins. John, do you want to address that as well? Uh, just, just a very quick answer. Uh, I agree with Art completely. Uh, it's like so many things, we try to oversimplify, you know. It's all, all of these things are probably operative in different sites in the lung at different times or in different lung situations. So that sometimes in certain areas there is fracture, there is ripping, there is tearing, there is opening direct mechanical opening. In other areas, there's signaling that's going on, mechano-signaling that's very important. In other areas, there's overstretching, sometimes there's blood flow being redirected. We, we think that all of these things are at some level imp important. The hierarchy will change depending on what the specific conditions are like. Uh, 